When people think of Yellowstone, they picture erupting geysers, colorful springs, and boiling ponds. But these are all just the surface expression of something much deeper, the Yellowstone supervolcano. But what's the difference between geyser eruptions and volcanic eruptions? And what do these geyser eruptions tell us about the state of Yellowstone's supervolcano? Are they a precursor to something much larger? In the last video, we met up with local expert Sean Wilsey to go through the geologic history of the Yellowstone supervolcano and whether it may be getting ready to erupt again. So be sure to watch that if you haven't yet. But in this video, I'll be covering the difference between Yellowstone's geyser and volcanic activity, how they're connected, how they're different, and what geysers can and can't tell us about Yellowstone's supervolcano. To start with, a geyser is a type of hot spring that intermittently erupts water and steam due to underground heat and pressure. So one major difference between geysers and volcanoes is that water is erupting out of geysers, not lava. And Yellowstone is home to over half the world's active geysers. But where does all that underground heat and pressure come from? And are geysers a warning of a future supervolcano eruption? For this, let's bring in our local expert, Yellowstone Ranger, and my good friend, Cameron Fetter. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so can you tell us where does the underground heat and pressure that drives this geyser activity come from? That's a great question. So all of our geysers here are driven by a very shallow magma chamber that is under our feet. That magma chamber is about 30 miles across by 45 miles wide and about 10 miles thick. It is quite literally one of the largest magma bodies in the United States. Now. That magma chamber is only about three miles below our feet, which plays a very big role into the hydrothermal systems that we have here at Yellowstone. Because that heat source is so shallow, there is a constant heat source that is feeding the underground aquifer systems that we have here in Yellowstone, leading to the massive number of geysers that we have here. Awesome. And so does the geyser activity mean that Yellowstone is going to have a volcanic eruption? Very common question. <laughs> Absolutely not, it doesn't. Hydrothermal activity here in Yellowstone happens separate from volcanic activity. In fact, we could have about 20 new geysers form here just within about a month and a half, and it would not mean anything in terms of volcanic activity. Change in Yellowstone is very normal, which might be a little bit different from other places where a sudden change in hydrothermal activity could mean something, but because Yellowstone is such a massive and diverse system, it means nothing. So although Yellowstone's supervolcano and geysers share the same heat source, that's pretty much where the similarities end. The geysers release thermal energy or heat regularly, whereas the volcano releases material rarely. And while geysers respond to small scale changes in water availability, pressure, and even nearby earthquakes, their behavior isn't always tied to magma movement. So if not the geysers alone, what would indicate deeper unrest in Yellowstone's underground magma chamber? Cam? There is quite a few things that we would have to look for here at Yellowstone to even begin to consider that we are at a state of unrest, and a bunch of these things would have to be happening at the same time. The biggest thing was that we would have to have a very sharp increase in earthquakes. So here in Yellowstone, we can average anywhere from about 50 to maybe 120 a month. Let's say that we go beyond that and we have maybe 500, 600 earthquakes a month. Might be a little bit of a cause for concern, but other things that we would have to look for as well would be changes in ground deformation. So that would be your ground uplift or ground subsidence. Now, thankfully in Yellowstone right now, we have been having a very long period of ground subsidence. So basically what that means is that the entire area of the caldera, generally speaking, has been sinking, which means that there has not been ongoing pressurization of the magma chamber underneath us. Another big thing that we would look for as well would just be overall gas emissions. Now, I'm not necessarily talking about just the geysers as a whole, but let's say that we just have a massive increase in sulfur dioxide, hydrogen sulfide, carbon dioxide, in places that we wouldn't normally be having thermal activity. That would be another indication that we could be having volcanic unrest here as well. But again, all three of these things would have to be happening at once for us to even be starting right. to have that conversation of, do we raise Yellowstone's alert level? Is there yeah. a possibility it could be erupting? But yeah. thankfully, we are at a point in time where that is just not a question. Wow. Yeah. Wait, so side note, you said 50 to 60 earthquakes here? Yeah. What causes the earthquakes here? That is a great question. So there is a lot of different things that can cause earthquakes here in Yellowstone, but the two biggest ones that we have are related to hydrothermal movement and also just general tectonic activity. 
Yellowstone is still technically in an area of the United States that is considered the Basin and Range Province. Stretches all the way from the Sierra Nevadas to here where we are standing in northwestern Wyoming. So, you have a lot of extension that is going on in the crust itself, but then of course you have all of this water from our hydrothermal systems that are moving underneath, and sometimes they can find a minor fault, they can cause that fault to slip, and then bam, you get earthquakes, you get an earthquake swarm, but then of course you have just the tectonic, uh, the tectonic stresses as well, which pull apart, and then you get a normal faulting like this, which causes a lot of the major earthquakes that we've had here as well. A good example of that was the 1959 7.3 Hebgen Lake earthquake. It is the largest earthquake to ever hit this region, but that one was purely tectonic. So if geysers begin erupting more frequently or unpredictably, showing increased temperatures, emitting different gases, and those changes coincide with ground uplift or sinking, earthquake swarms, and or changes in carbon dioxide or sulfur dioxide emissions, then scientists start to look more closely. But again, no single geyser can predict a volcanic eruption. And Yellowstone is one of the most heavily monitored volcanic systems in the world. The U.S. Geological Survey Yellowstone Volcano Observatory uses seismometers to detect earthquakes in the region, GPS and INSAR to track uplift and subsidence, gas analyzers to measure CO2 and sulfur, thermal cameras and chemical analyses to monitor hydrothermal activity of springs and geysers, and even more things that I'm not even mentioning to form a multi-parameter warning system, which as of right now shows no signs of imminent volcanic eruption. But one thing a lot of you guys asked me to ask Cam when I poked you guys for questions is why are these geysers so predictable and consistent? Like what makes Old Faithful so faithful? The reason that we have a bunch of predictable geysers here, so just to be specific, in all of Yellowstone we have about five, six predictable geysers. It kind of depends on the year. Um, but the reason some of them are so predictable is because their plumbing system is very precise, it is very exact, and because we have so many years and decades of observations on these geysers, which aids in the prediction process. But if we're talking just about the plumbing system, there's two very important things that our predictable geysers need, and that is a chamber to build up the pressure, and there also needs to be constriction in the vent as well. For example, the constriction in Old Faithful's vent narrows to about the size of your fist, 20 feet below the cone. If this didn't exist, Old Faithful would not get nearly as high as it does. Old Faithful can get anywhere from 120 to 186 feet during major eruptions. So like if that fist width, you know, vent widened, mm -hmm. that would get less high and less eruptive, right? That is correct, okay. yes. So the geyser wouldn't necessarily go extinct altogether. It really kind of just depends on what changes in the plumbing system. But if the constriction widens, like you said, you would get a geyser that doesn't shoot as high, that might still be equally as voluminous as far as the water output, um, but it just wouldn't shoot as high because it doesn't have that tight, narrow corridor to squeeze right. up and then shoot up outwards. And equally, I saw a sign near Morning Glory that it can get smaller too and it mm -hmm. can even plug up. Yes. How does that happen? Generally, the way that happens is unfortunately from human interference most of the time. Sometimes you can have branches that get blown into, into thermal features and they sink a little bit. Unfortunately, though, here in Yellowstone, the biggest issue that we have is people throwing rocks, throwing objects into hot springs. Now, that doesn't only take away from the color, like Morning Glory, for example, but in the case of geysers like this one, it can quite literally clog the vent and cause the geyser to go extinct. Oh. But in a different scenario, on the other hand, it can actually cause an explosion. I have not been here to witness that, but oh my God. theoretically, if a vent is clogged highly enough and it, the water cannot be diverted elsewhere, it would cause an explosion or that geyser to be rejuvenated in an, in an intensity that has not been seen before. That's crazy because we were literally like walking around and you mentioned how like they're not allowed to throw rocks, mm -hmm. visitors can't throw rocks in there. And I was thinking, a rock, like why does that matter? And then I saw that sign and you mentioned the explosion and that makes yes. sense. Like if you tighten that vent, that mm -hmm. can that can be crazy. It's, a lot of bad things can happen from that. Oh my God. A, you get upset visitors who are crying because they can't see the geyser anymore. Right. Or B, you have an explosion and people potentially get hurt. That is the more extreme example, but it absolutely could happen. Oh my gosh. Well, yeah, and you don't want them to get plugged up and go extinct either. They're no. amazing. So. They're amazing. Wow. Very few places in the world so. that have geysers like we do here. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So while geysers and hot springs are beautiful and powerful, 
they're not volcanoes. They're more like the breath of the planet than the guts of the planet. So I hope you guys enjoyed learning about these geological processes with Cam and I. And if you haven't yet, be sure to check out my video with Sean on the geologic history of Yellowstone to learn how this amazing super volcano came to be. And in the next video, I'll go over what Yellowstone's hot springs might tell us about the origin of life on Earth. See you there. Bye. So Cam, what are the craziest conspiracy theory misconceptions that you've heard about Yellowstone? I have heard, I feel like all of them, <laughs> but yet people somehow keep on coming up with new ones. I think the biggest misconception, especially the one that we have had this season, is that animals were allegedly moving the park because they could sense something that we humans could not. And the reality is, is that that just did not happen whatsoever. All of our animals here, they mostly stay put. There are seasonal migrations that happen here in the park, but people are very quick to assume that a mass exodus of animals, say elk or bison from the park, means that there's some strange activity going on. Right. And the truth is, they are seasonal migrations and they yeah. have been happening for thousands of years here. Oh, that yeah. makes sense. So, That's funny. Is, yeah. that, is that the craziest? Or are there, are there I think other? as far as the ones that like I've heard recent? this season, that is definitely the craziest one that has happened. But I oh think just the general misconception of, you know, people seeing a geyser that has not erupted in, say, a long time, people point to that and they say, oh, something is strange must be going on underneath the surface. Right. And the reality is, well, yes, there is something going on underneath the surface, but it does yeah. not relate to the magma chamber. Yeah. Um, so just to give you a sense of kind of what we're dealing with right now, the magma chamber that is about three miles below our feet is approximately 20% molten material. In order to have any sort of eruption here at Yellowstone, so we'll just say a lava flow, your very, very low level eruption that you could have here at Yellowstone, you would need at least 50% molten material in the magma chamber. So yeah. refilling that much, um, that much space, again, it's 30 miles, 45 miles by 10 miles thick, that is a process that can take thousands yeah. of years. Okay, yeah. so animals leaving, it's okay, that's normal. That is normal. Geysers, normal. Good to know. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Absolutely, for, for yeah. On. Oh my gosh, awesome. <laughs> Yay. Ah, thank Fantastic. you. Fantastic.